Well, I think every time you tell a story, you are getting sharpening that pencil just a little bit, right? You're, you're, you're fine tuning the story and the, and the smallest little thing that you do m can make a difference in how that story lands. And I think with, with your process, I, when I used to tell stories, I thought I was just telling stories, but this makes it deliberate, right? This makes you think about how you're telling the story. This makes you think about the process that goes into that. Um, and so that was eye opening for me that it's not just sitting down and telling your story. It's, it's the thinking out the story and, and what's the point that you want to make and, and how do you want to make that, that point and, and the intricacy of it, uh, the stage of it, um, the theater of it. Welcome to the Storytelling That Sticks for Business and Life 20 Minute Podcast. Hey, hang in there with me this time. It's a little bit longer than 20 minutes, but it's well worth it. I'm your keynote and story coach, Doug Stevenson. In this podcast series, I'm going to share with you some simple and practical storytelling techniques and holistic approaches, tips and tricks from my 25 years plus keynote and storytelling experience. Lessons learned from teaching storytelling to small groups of leaders and sales teams, to main stage keynotes in hotel ballrooms and huge convention centers in front of thousands of people. My main goal here is to give you the tools you need to choose, craft, and deliver your stories in a way that makes them stick. Stories that make a point, but at the same time sell you and your product or service. Now, in this episode, you're going to hear from Dave Boduck a corporate trainer and a really good storyteller. Dave has used the skills he's learned from my story theater method to create some really sticky stories, some of which you'll hear about in this episode. He was first introduced to my storytelling methodology from Bill Raymond way back in 2006. Now you can listen to my interview with Bill Raymond in episode 11, Good to Great Storytelling with Bill Raymond. Now, if you feel that you learned something valuable today, please click on the follow or subscribe button. All right, let's get started. My name is Dave Boduck, and uh, I am a trainer uh, in an organization called Nexstar, and we're a best practices business for the plumbing, heating, cooling, and electrical trades. And uh, I've been a trainer going on 15 years now. Uh, was a member trainer, uh, which meant that uh, I was running a business, a plumbing, heating, cooling business. And then I kind of freelanced as a trainer once a month uh, and was able to fine tune that craft over a number of years. And then in 2019, uh, I joined Nextar as a trainer full time. And what that looks like is, you know, we, we have management classes, leadership classes, customer service classes, um, ranging anywhere from 20 to 100 participants at any given time. Uh, I'm on the road quite a bit, but I also do some online training too. So your, your presentations are skills-based, technical, technical and skills-based? Yeah, you know, and that's an interesting part about our classes is it, they are they are technical in in terms of skills as it relates to customer service for the most part, um, management tr training, for instance, as well. Um, but there's a motivational component too, and I think that in in my experience, sometimes the best way to get the point across is through a story, um, and that's why you know I feel like the the concepts that we've learned from you over time. Uh, and I had experience with story theater method way, way back when Bill Raymond introduced us at, at the very first training camp I ever went to. Uh, and that was some, that was 2006, I believe. Um, and so as far back as then recognizing the power of stories in what we do, and I think they can be both motivational, but also hammer home some of the most critical points that might otherwise just fly right by them. Now in the context of, uh, growing your training skills and your storytelling skills over the years. I mean, you heard about me and Story Theater Method from Bill back in 2006. How has your storytelling evolved and improved as a result of the Story Theater Method and the skills, tools, techniques that I taught you? How many of those or which ones of those do you feel most impacted your ability to be better as a storyteller, to be more engaging and more persuasive? 
when I used to tell stories, I thought I was just telling stories, but this makes it deliberate, right? This makes you think about how you're telling the story. This makes you think about the process that goes into that. Um, and so that was eye opening for me that it's not just sitting down and telling your story. It's, it's the thinking out the story and, and what's the point that you want to make and, and how do you want to make that, that point and, and the intricacy of it, uh, the stage of it, um, the theater of it. I will say the one thing um, that people, the participants remember uh, from your, from episode five, just that you, you, you had talked about it, it was uh, the phrase it pays and finding that. Uh, and that's not always easy. I, I have a story that I'm telling right now, and I haven't found the phrase that pays. And I know it'll come to me. I just haven't found the perfect phrase that pays. Now I've got other stories where the phrase that pays just literally popped out and I, I, I didn't have to do anything. There was a, a time we were walking in, in Little Italy in New York. And there's a gentleman, this is the middle of the Great Recession, a gentleman's out there in freezing cold. And we're wandering around shivering, looking for this Italian restaurant in, in the midst of a million t Italian restaurants. And he, he, this gentleman comes out to the curb while we're standing there trying to figure out where this restaurant is. And he says, where are you going? What's a, the what's a restaurant you're looking for? And we said, well, we're looking for this restaurant. And he says, mama's in the kitchen. You love my restaurant. And mama's in the kitchen became this mantra of the story. And what, what it was all about is outbound calling. And, you know, when the business isn't there, you got to go out there and get it. And mama's in the kitchen just became the phrase that pays. And to this day, I still have people come up to me and they'll say, mama's in the kitchen. Yep. I had a participant uh, that was in one class and it was back-to-back -back classes and we finished the, the day. And then he came back the next day and he asked, are you going to tell the princess story? <laughs> and I had just told the princess story in the prior class, but he wanted to hear it again. And, and so, you know, and that, that story is be a princess. And, and so they, they do, they remember it and, and, and they tell others and they want to hear it again. Uh, if you, if you do it right. Now, how long is your be a princess story? How many minutes? Um, it's about eight minutes. It's a little long. Um, and you know, for me, uh, that's a lot of setting the scene, uh, of going up in the castle and seeing all these princesses in Cinderella and, and that this doesn't, wasn't just, and I actually, one of the things I do now, when I tell that story in a, in a nutshell, that story is about a time that I took my daughter to have breakfast with the princesses. And I was struck with how focused and intent these individuals were, these princesses were. And how they treated every kid like they were the most important thing in the world at that moment in time. Uh, setting that scene, which is one of the, you know, the, the first step. Uh, Nine in, steps, yeah. Yep. Yeah, uh, is, is very, very important. And so, you know, finding ways to take time to do that, I, I found is, has been extremely powerful as well. Well, that's, uh, I think, very instructive to many of my listeners, because I think when they come to me at first, and start hearing about the nine steps and how you need to script the story and you need to take the time to get it right and, and really you know, think about it and consider it. And what words are you using? What adjectives are you using? How are you setting the scene? And then they hear you say that you have an eight minute story. And I think a lot of people are shocked that, you mean in a business context, you can get up in front of the room as a trainer and take eight minutes to tell a story that makes a point. Mm -hmm. And what you've experienced is now that you have the confidence and understanding of this methodology, you set the scene, you introduce the characters, you begin the journey, you encounter the obstacle, you overcome the obstacle, you resolve the story, you make the point. Now that you have that template and you sit down and you start working through it, it does expand the story. Am I correct? Yeah. And I think you, you know, as you tell the story, you, you remember things, um, maybe you amplify things a little bit, um, whatever it takes to make it stick. And I think that's the most important thing. Can you make it, is the story going to make it stick? Um, and you know, that, that's the biggest question I ask is how can, what, what else can I do to make this stick as I'm telling that story? Well, the whole concept of time making a story stick, making the lesson stick is did it actually impact the listener to change their behavior, change their thought process, because you're trying to teach them to think differently about customer service or about management or about leadership. And you're trying to get one 
idea, one concept so deeply embedded in their consciousness into their brain that they make a change. Am I correct? Isn't this all about change, getting them to change and think differently or act differently? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. So I'm, I'm headed out today to do a training mastery class, which is basically training other people to, to train right. uh, effectively. And one of the, the, the first question I ask them is what's the primary objective of any, of any training? And it's to initiate behavioral change in an, in, in an individual. And I think why, in my opinion, the re reason why stories are so powerful is because it it brings the person into the content. It brings the, if you do it well, you bring the person into the story themselves. Well, we learn through experience. I think we right. all learn through experience. The reason that you or I do things correctly now is because we messed up somewhere along the way and figured out, well, that's, <laughs> that is not the way to do it. Let's figure out how we can do it right. So we learn through experience. Well, I believe that when I tell a story, when you tell a story and that story has an obstacle or crisis or some kind of challenge in it, they experience themselves inside that story. They're experiencing that pain without having to go through it themselves in their own life. They're experiencing it in an eight minute story. Yeah. And by the end of that eight minute story, when you make the point, they feel like, oh, that's what I need to do differently without having to go through it in their life. So you actually make them more a better leader quickly, very mm -hmm. quickly in a couple of hours of training or a better customer service representative or whatever, because it is always about immersing them in that experience. Now, as you talk about an eight minute story over the years, have you gained more and more courage to be able to indulge in taking a story to that level, knowing that they're engaged. They might not look like it because mm -hmm. that's the thing that I think freaks people out is like eight minutes. I'm going to tell a story for eight. They're going to get bored, but they don't get right. bored, do they? No, you know, I, I, I it's no, yeah, especially that princess story in particular. You know, I, I hear stories about people, they go back to their shops and they, they buy everybody tiaras because they want to, <laughs> they want to live that moment and right. And they want to be a princess. Right. And so what does that look like in your role? And that's the whole point of the story. What does it look like in your role to be a princess, to have that much focus? And so, uh, no, I don't think that they get, um, bored with it at all. One thing I want to go back to that you mentioned the experience that you're giving them. And I think that this is very powerful and, and an important point that I never really thought about before. One of the things that I talk about is um, our, our unconscious mind and imagination and that your unconscious mind um, is the most powerful part of our brains. And it processes millions and millions of pieces of information. We don't tap into it hardly at all, um, but it wants to keep us safe and it wants to find the easiest way. The other interesting thing about the unconscious mind is it doesn't recognize reality from fantasy. And when you can tap into imagination and provide someone with an experience there that they imagine it plants that into their unconscious mind to the point that they feel like they've had actually had that experience. So you can trick your unconscious mind into thinking that this actually happened to me. Yeah, it's actually, incredible. there's a scientific term for it and it's called a mirror neuron response. And that is why story theater works better than just standing still and telling a story. The more you act it out, the more you engage yourself in it, take yourself back to those moments and act out like being with the princess and getting down on a knee and going eye to eye with the princess and having them see that they feel like they're there, but it's a mirror neuron response. Like you say, it tricks the brain. Yeah. And who are the well, people that you're talk to me about your audience a little bit? Uh, it, it's a wide range. I mean, these will be technicians that work in customers' homes. They will be management um, leaders within the organizations. They'll be uh, customer service representatives, dispatchers. Um, that's one of the things I love about what I get to do as a trainer is I get to work with a wide variety of individuals. Um, that said, some of the stories I tell are the same regardless of the the, the, the participant. Um, one The one story I'm still working on right now, and I um, haven't quite found that phrase that pays uh, is a class is something that is a story that I tell in almost every class. Well, let's work, let's work on that one. Let's, okay. let's work on that. <laughs> let's take the time right now, because what I, I think the phrase that pays is so critical for people. But the reason I did an entire episode on it is it's hard to find the phrase that pays. Once you mm -hmm. do, it's gold. Yeah. 
but it's not easy. So tell me about the story. Tell me the story a little bit. Well, um, it's a tough story. Uh, I mentioned in 2019, I left my business. Um, and that was an unexpected move for me. Uh, I had grown up in the, in the trades for 25 years and started as a co-op student in high school. And on December 10th, 2019, I had a meeting with my business partner and they let me know that they were going to go a different direction and that, uh, I was no longer going to be a part of the business. And, you know, in that moment, 25 years of my life was gone that day I was going to be driving to a training in Indianapolis. Um, and, uh, my business partner called and asked if we could meet, which was not uncommon. We, I would always check in before I'd head out of town to make sure that things were covered. So we met up at a restaurant and, and, um, you know, I grabbed a seat and we, it was normal course of business. You were talking about what was going on. And, uh, that day was in particular important because, um, our electrical, manager had put in his three weeks notice. So I wanted to give him an update on that and make sure that he was aware of that conversation and what needed to come of it. And so we're sitting in this booth. We had just finished uh, lunch. It was a light lunch. Um, And I'll never forget that at that moment where I was getting ready to go and the meeting was over, he pulled out um, a manila envelope and he puts it on the table and he opens it up and I'm looking at this document inside the envelope and it had both of our logos on it. And I thought, Oh, this, okay. I wonder what this is. And he says, Amy and I have talked and we no longer want you to be a part of the company. And I, immediately went into like a shock mode. And I think I lived there for a year in this mode of how could this happen to me? Why would they do this to me? And this wasn't just a business partner. They were friends. Uh, Amy and Mike were good friends of ours for a really long time. Uh, had six kids and, and and they played with our kids and it's been hard on our family as a, as a, as well as me as an individual. And I remember he asked as, as we concluded that conversation. And to be honest, it was a little bit of a blur because I couldn't re- even grasp what was happening. I do remember I'm walking out and I've, I'm holding this paper in my right hand and I'm just, it's just kind of dangling down with my arm. And I'm just stumbling out of this restaurant in shock. And I go out the door and I get into my Jeep and I'm sitting there in my Jeep and I'm looking at the front door of the restaurant and he's there now in the foyer looking out at me. And I'm realizing I got to call my wife and tell her what just happened. And I'll, I'll never forget. I called her and I said, you need to sit down, which is the most cliche thing you could possibly say, right? <laughs> you need to sit down. You're never going to believe this. Um, I just lost my job. Mike told me that they don't want me to part, be a part of the business anymore. And so I mentioned, I lived there in that space of shock and circumstance for a year couldn't sleep, had trouble eating. Like it was, it was rough. And I'll never forget. I'm sitting there in class in that moment. I was 100% responsible for everything that happened to me that day, that my 25 years in that organization and the fact that I left the business in that way was completely my responsibility, that there were things that I did do and things more importantly that I didn't do, the actions I didn't take that led me to that moment in time where I was powerless. So I'm the, and that's where I struggle. Like right here is where I want that phrase that pays. And I've thought of things like be responsible. Um, I just, it's just not enough for me, but I, okay. ha- I haven't. Yeah. Let, then, then here's the thing you did. Th- this was very powerful story. I felt it. Um, 
one of the things that I think is is powerful, even here in a podcast, is 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 how you felt the emotion of the story even today as you're telling it. And that came through in the pauses, in the tone of your voice, and in in the way that you tell it, the mood that you set. Now, the the part of finding the phrase that pays, if you go back to episode five, where I talked about the phrase that pays, you go back to that period of time when you were in a state of shock and circumstance for a year. During that period of time, you had to pull yourself out of it. Your wife talked to you, other people talked to you, you talked to yourself. When you slowly started to have those revelations that, man, I created that. I'm responsible for that. I did that. There's things I did and things I didn't do. And eventually you either took an action to turn things around and go get another job and get your life back on track, or you made a decision. And that's where the phrase that pays comes from actions or decisions. And so where along the line in that year, of moping and feeling in shock and, and not being able to function well, where did you snap out of it and what did you do? Well, it literally, it quite literally was when I was teaching that, that moment that teaching a group of people about the concept of ordinary and extraordinary and while they're doing an activity. So I had, I had given them the activity. All right, let's have a discussion. What do you, what do you think defines an individual who's ordinary versus an individual who's extraordinary? What would, what would those people do? What kind of mindset do they have? And so they're working on this activity. And while they're doing that, I was sitting there and I, at, in that moment, you know, for a year, I, I couldn't think of anything else. And so, you know, when, anytime I had a free moment, that, that, that was what I was thinking about. <clears throat> And so it was in that exact moment where it dawned on me that, you know, look, you're how I started asking myself, how am I responsible uh, for what happened? You know, I'm sitting here teaching this group of people to be responsible for their actions and inactions. And yet I've been living in this victim circumstance for a year. How am I responsible for what happened that day? What are the things that I did and didn't do as a result uh, that led me to that day? And that was when I had the realization is as I was teaching ordinary, extraordinary to those people. And I started at questioning my own actions and inaction. What is it that you do now as a leader to make sure that doesn't happen again on a daily basis? When you're about to not do something, what do you say to yourself? When you're about to not say something, what do you, what do you, what do you do to, to, to do you step up? Do you say it? Do you speak up? Do you lead by example? What, what is it that you do? And I think the, the, my mantra in my head is, you know, I'm responsible. Um, you know, whatever is happening around me, whatever is happening, quote unquote, to me, I'm responsible for that. Um, so maybe we take it from be responsible to be responsible to yourself, which is the flip from well, I need to be responsible to my coworkers. I need to respond to my boss. I need to be responsible to my kids and my wife. Be responsible to yourself is a little bit, it's, it's that extra piece to yourself makes them take responsibility. You can, you can say take responsibility and people have heard it. Right. But if you put that emphasis on yourself, because that's what I'm hearing. And I'm not saying that's your phrase to pay because yeah. sometimes we're trying to come up with a look for the limo. Right. Yes. And that's what I have been butter. looking for. <laughs> but, well, that, but that, see, that's what I'm exploring with you is, is there something your wife said to you? Is there something that one of these people in the training room, when you said, what, 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 what do you need to do? Or what do you do? Sometimes the phrase that pays, as I've said in the, in, in the thing comes from a Yoda. My limo driver was my Yoda. He's the one who said, look for the limo. Did your wife say something? Did, 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 did one of your kids say something? Did one of these people in the class say something? Sometimes it comes from them. Well, there are so many conversations that, you know, my wife and I had um, about this over time as well. Um, and there may be something there. I never really explored that avenue of it. Um, you know, I think the thing that strikes me 
about this is, is how blind I was to it for a really long time. Cause you live in this victim mentality for, for, you know, for me, it was a year and you, it's almost like you can't see. And then all of a sudden you, I had that moment. Um, and so I really, I've lived in that moment where I had that epiphany. I've never really thought back to much more than that. Um, so that's something I have to explore. Well, there's wake up, there's open your eyes, there's look yourself in the mirror. I'm just thinking you can't see me right now, but <laughs> oh, no, um, that's, that's, that's what this is. It's a yeah. rumination process. I've, I've even said, everybody thinks I just come up with my own phrase of pace. No, <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I sit with them for days sometimes. Well, and it's interesting because the princess story evolved over time for me because originally my phrase that pays for that was hire more princesses. And where that came from was a very specific moment in class where somebody asked, I had already told the story and somebody had asked, um, well, what if I don't have any princesses? You know, what if I don't have any princess working princesses working for me? And I said, well, hire more princesses. And that became my phrase that pays that's for a, good a while. One. No, that's it was. a good one. That's a very yeah. good one. It was. And I, but you know, I changed that into just be a princess. And you know what, and this is why I'm so adamant about that phrase that pays, because it is for me the thing that people will remember. And even without context of anything, you know, hide the pill in the peanut butter. If, if all you said to me was hide the pill in the peanut butter, I'm going to think, what does that mean? If all I said to you was be a princess, you're going to be like, well, what does that mean? If all I said to you is mama's in the kitchen, you're going to be like, well, what does that mean? Right. And so th that, that question that you ask, if all you hear is just that phrase that pays, if you can get them asking, well, what does that mean? Right that's the whole thing. And so I, what I worry about on the responsibility story is <clears throat> if I say be responsible or I'm responsible, that's something that maybe we've heard too much. Right. And right. so it could go right in one ear and one, right out the other. Um, and so, but I love what you shared about exploring the, the journey and those moments in time, the conversations, because that's something that I hadn't explored a lot. Well, also, you said uh, it, it's as if I was blind and I opened my eyes. See, a lot of times the phrase that pays pops out when you don't think you said it. Yeah. I mean, open your eyes is a good phrase that pays because it has the connotation that I was blind. I couldn't see that I was responsible. I was blind. And when I opened my eyes, I was able to see that I was the one who had put myself in that situation. Mm -hmm. How about you? Are you blind to your own victimhood? Are you blind to the fact that you're blaming everybody else? Are you blind? And you can go through this because we're all blind yeah. to certain things. I don't always see myself. That's why I've got this lovely wife called Deborah who says, honey, honey. <laughs> <laughs> and I could just hear it coming. It's like, did you hear what you just said? And it's yeah. like, oh, I didn't hear. I didn't know that I was doing that. We don't see it. But when you say open your eyes, that is asking people to look inside themselves rather than looking at everybody else and blaming. And so that's yeah. a place there's 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 some place to go there, because in your year of shock. There is a moment where you did something like you opened your eyes. Yeah. And we're looking for that moment. Now there's probably 30 of them. <laughs> yeah. But we got to find one. Now, sometimes, like I said, if, if let's just say it was open your eyes, that's your phrase that pays. Mm -hmm. You give it to your wife. Because you're bitching and moaning and bitching and moaning and you're yeah. having the same conversation at dinner over and over again and you're moping around the house and finally one day your, your, your wife says, honey, open your eyes. You did this. This is real. You did this, honey. Open your eyes. Take responsibility. Open your eyes. Look at yourself. Yeah. Uh, look at yourself. Open your eyes. So we don't have to go with take responsibility because I agree. It won't land very well. Well, and I like that Yoda concept too, of who's going to be, who's going to be that person, that, that character in the story who develops that thing. 
uh, and, and has that realization for you. And I think that that's important to Doug, uh, th- that point. Uh, and we've talked about this before because, you know, it's called theater for a reason. And I think that there are sometimes there are aspects of a story that you kind of need to build in order to get the story to land a little bit. Maybe, maybe you embellish a little bit, or maybe you create uh, a conversation so that the story can land a little bit better. And I struggled with that uh, quite a bit early on. Cause I felt like, well, am, am I being disingenuous here? Am I not telling the truth? Um, and I think the point of, uh, of any story is making sure it, 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 it initiates that change in another individual. And if I can, you know, create this piece of the story, which helps it land, which helps them remember it a little bit more. I feel like that's, that's the point. That's the important piece. Um, and, and it needs to be done sometimes. And so just for your listeners, that was something that was hard for me. Um, but yet it can make your stories more impactful, uh, as a result of that. Well, it also goes back to what I call the plausibility factor. Is it plausible that sometime in that year, You and your wife had a conversation. And is it plausible that she might have said, honey, open your eyes? Mm -hmm. Is it plausible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you don't know every conversation because quite honestly, you and your wife had lots of conversations. Yep, absolutely. (laughs) Very deep conversations, very in your face conversations. For a year. (laughs) For a lot of time. It's like, and she loved you enough to, you know, say something like, open your eyes, honey. I love you, but open your eyes. You're blind. You're not seeing this. I mean, that's how we get to the phrase of pace. So thanks for going through that process, because I think for the listeners, it's really helpful to understand the phrase that pays. And what I'm hearing from you is one of the most powerful things you learned from the story theater method with me is the phrase that pays and how important that is. Yeah. And it's funny because the phrase that pays is a phrase that pays. And I remember the phrase that pays from 2006 when when Bill Raymond introduced us to story theater method you know and that phrase the phrase that pays is something that stuck with me all those years so that was memorable and that impacted me and in initiated change in in the stories that i tell cuz now i'm always looking for that phrase that pays so absolutely uh, is is it's something that i think about a lot when I'm creating a new story and I'm, I'm glad to have found in, in the stories that I tell often. And for those of you who are listening to this episode without having listened to the last episode, episode five, um, or not the last episode, episode five, mm-hmm. go back and listen to the phrase that pays what's the point episode five, and you'll, you'll, you'll learn more about how you can get to where we are. So the last thing I'd like to ask you about is you're in a business and the business needs to be profitable. The business needs to succeed. You need to continually be so good at the front of the room that it generates more business, that people talk about you, they refer you, all those kinds of things. This is the sales and marketing aspect, the storytelling. Does it impact the bottom line of your business? Well, I think it impacts my effectiveness as a trainer. And if, I, if I'm a more effective trainer, then it absolutely impacts the bottom line of the business. Because to your point, people are going to tell that story to other people back at their shop. And then when those people come to training or they're sent to training because of the experience that the prior person had, uh, it impacts our organization. The more impactful I am, the more the bottom line of our organization is impacted because more and more people are going to want to go to my trainings. One of the things that I think is helpful in context is I know that you guys do not just one day trainings, but sometimes multiple day trainings. And there's an awful lot of skill building and other things going into these trainings. And the stories are a part of it. But if you actually broke down how many minutes you're in front of an audience versus how many minutes you're telling stories, the stories are the most impactful and memorable. Mm-hmm. They're a very small percentage of the minutes you spend in front of an audience. Would you agree with that? Oh, the minuscule. You know, we, we do eight hour days uh, for three days and, you know, I might have a couple of stories each day, but, you know, those stories are five to eight minutes. So, you know, t- what total 15 minutes of stories each day. Uh, but yes, they are the most impactful thing. They are the one that people want to hear again. Uh, so absolutely. <laughs> it's, 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 uh, it's, it's the most engaging, the most powerful eight minutes you'll do in front of any audience is to tell a really well-crafted story theater story. 
Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that, that's the thing for me too, is treating it like that first, you know, it's a deliberate, it's a deliberate thing that you're building and it is theater to an extent, you know, you, you, you have to play that role and you have to, you have to be that actor to an extent. And yet you're not an actor. You've never taken an acting class. No, no, not at all. <laughs> but I feel like an actor sometimes when I'm up there in front of people. And yet you're saying, I, I feel like I'm acting out my stories without any acting training. And that is very liberating for so many people that they hear story theater and they go, well, but I, I'm not an actor. I haven't studied acting. It doesn't matter. We can all be actors when we're acting out the story and that's all that it takes to engage the audience at a deeper level would you agree with that absolutely yep absolutely yeah well this has been a pleasure thank you so much dave um is there any last piece of advice you'd give to the listeners here about taking their stories more seriously to get a better result well i think you know follow the process uh for sure and the more that process becomes ingrained in how you tell stories, the easier it gets. Uh, to, to to our conversation about my story that I'm working on, don't get frustrated. Um, you'll you'll find you'll find the perfect way uh, to to share that story, and you just keep working on it and working on it and working on it. And I think you know the nine steps that that we follow um, helps us accomplish that because it breaks it down a little bit more for us. Great, great, great. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. And I love talking to you again. That that uh, that workshop that we did up in Wisconsin was just uh, a, a joyous end to my on the road uh, speaking career. So thank you for that once again. It was awesome. Uh, and we will all remember it uh, forever because uh, it was one of my favorite, if not my favorite uh, training camp ever. So thank you for sharing with us that week. Thank you. Have a great day, Dave. All right. See you, Doug. Bye. Bye. Okay, well, that's it for this episode. Wasn't that a good one? Told you it was going to be worth it. If you feel that you learned something valuable today, something that you can use that will make your story stick, stories that change hearts, minds, and behavior, while at the same time making you and your business memorable, marketable, and monetizable, there are three things I'd like you to do. First, click on the follow or subscribe button. Subscribe to this podcast. And second, share this podcast with three or more people on Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn. And third, leave a review wherever it is that you're listening to this podcast. And here's something else. If you have a podcast and you'd like me to be a guest, let's talk. And as always, I'd love to hear from you with your questions and comments. Let me know that you're out there listening and learning. You can also follow me on LinkedIn. And if you want help with your stories, keynotes, or TED Talks, or if you want to schedule your free 20-minute coaching session, email Deborah at DougStevenson.com. Thanks for listening. Until the next episode, I'm Doug Stevenson.